So. First of all, I want to thank uh, Professor Dessal for the introduction. And uh, as he mentioned, uh, uh, we have studied, my lab has studied for many years, stars in kinases and their role in human tumors. And uh, a few years ago, we decided to focus on a specific tumor, namely gastric cancer, uh, with the purpose of identifying, validate, and novel targets and optimize the therapeutic strategy. Cancer is the fourth most common cancer worldwide, and the second cause, more or less like um, HCC, so depending on the years, of global cancer-related deaths. And uh, the, the, this is a multifactorial disease with a genetic background and many identified environmental factors. There are strong ethnic differences uh, with area with a very, very high incidence. It's present both as a um, familial and, uh, and sporadic tumor, and around uh, 10 to 15% of uh, gastric cancer are familial. At present, the uh, prognosis is quite poor, and uh, the surgery in, with or without chemotherapy is uh, the uh, golden standard. However, uh, in advanced tumor, the median overall survival is less than one year. So it's, uh, I mean, new strategies are really needed. Uh, going to targeted therapies, only three therapies have been uh, approved. Uh, that is uh, Tarstuzumab and uh, Tarstuzumab Deruxecan against uh, um, R2 and uh, the, um, uh, drug, the anti-angiogenic drug Ramsirma. Recently also immunotherapy has been approved. So um, not much, uh, what about this tumor very, very rapidly? From an histological point of view, the probably the most widely used classification is the one of Lorraine, which uh, identifies uh, two types, two types, ty sorry, two types of tumor, uh, intestinal type and diffuse type. And not much was known about the molecular characterization of gastric cancer until uh, 2014, when uh, two groups uh, classified at the molecular level uh, ga gastric cancer. And the most widely used, at least in the Western countries, is the uh, classification of the TCGA. Uh, around 50% of uh, this tumor uh, are characterized by chromosomal instability, and they show uh, amplification of uh, several uh, receptor tyrosine kinases as well as RAS. 20% around are uh, microsatellite instable, and they are characterized by, of course, a high tumor burden and a an high frequency of PA3 kinase mutation. 10% uh, uh, are characterized by the presence of the <clears throat> Epstein Barr virus. And also in this case, we have a very high frequency of uh, pietri kinase mutation and uh, a sign of uh, immune uh, activation. Finally, 20% of this tumor are defined as genomically stable, which means nothing, but uh, quite frequently they have uh, alteration in genes involved in uh, cell addiction. So uh, to study this tumor, uh, we uh, had, of course, uh, to generate a network of centers uh, because, uh, uh, I mean, to collect the tumors uh, from uh, all the north of Italy and part of the center. And uh, um, the, um, we have now collected more than 850 gastric tumors, and uh, we have decided to use them to generate a multi-level platform of a patient-derived xenograft that uh, at present represent, uh, at least in our opinion, the model that be better recapitulate, uh, that best recapitulate the um, biology of human tumors. So practically speaking, uh, when uh, we receive a, um, I mean, a specimen, we implant it subcutaneously or orthotopically, very rarely orthotopically. Uh, in a non-immunocompetent mouse. Once the tumor is grown, we remove it and uh, we cut it and we reimplant in several mice to generate a cohort of animals all bearing the very same tumor. So on this cohort, we can uh, perform uh, preclinical trials. We have now uh, collected more than 250, generated more than 250 uh, PDXs. And uh, um, I mean, to our knowledge, this is the largest collection uh, of gastric cancer PDXs. We also derive uh, in vitro materials such as cell lines and organoids 
uh, to perform in vitro studies and, and uh, um, biochemical studies. Of course, uh, this, uh, all these models have been molecularly annotated. We evaluate the, um, MSI, the, the uh, microsatellite status, the ABV status, and we perform transcriptomic and uh, bullet exon sequences. And of course, this information are very important for, the, um, for selecting the model according to the question we are, we are asking. So um, we have uh, used this platform to try to uh, give an answer to many problems. And uh, so one of them was we, were, we have been interested in finding if the epidermal growth factor receptors could be a good therapeutic target in gastric cancer. Uh, in fact, uh, many preclinical and early clinical trials have shown the, the efficacy of targeting EGFR in uh, EGFR addicted gastric cancer. However, um, neg negative results have been obtained in random mice trials with uh, EGF receptor inhibitor. And uh, uh, these uh, uh, negative results have hampered the development of uh, EGF receptor inhibitor in uh, gastric cancer. However, it has to be underlined that uh, these studies have been performed in molecularly non-selected tumors. So uh, one, uh, we uh, got in touch with one of the, uh, of the PI of one of these trials, and we analyzed better results. And uh, the retrospective analysis of this trial showed that uh, uh, probably uh, the uh, tumors with EGF receptor amplification might benefit for, uh, from EGF, the use of uh, EGF receptor inhibitors. And so this prompted us to revisit the use of uh, uh, EGF receptor inhibitors in this context. So first of all, uh, we uh, were interested in finding uh, um, a prognostic uh, value of EGFR amplification. So we analyzed around 10,000 patients. And as you can see, uh, we found that, that clearly the um, gain of copy number of the EGF receptor is associated with the worst prognosis. Another thing we found uh, always uh, through the analysis of the uh, trials is that uh, when you treat uh, uh, um, with EGF receptor inhibitor, I mean, they were, this was expected, but uh, it was good to find it, uh, the co-amplification of uh, other tyrosine kinases hampers the efficacy of the use of uh, uh, EGF receptor inhibitors. In fact, uh, the highest is the number of uh, RTKs, of um, copy number gain of RTKs, and the worst is the overall survival in, in patients treated with gefitinib. So uh, to try to um, verify if uh, uh, the, the amplify, EJ percent amplified tumors can uh, take uh, an advantage by the use of uh, EJ percent targeting, we um, selected in our platform EGF receptor amplified model. And with amplified, I mean at least eight copies, because this is the threshold that is considered clinically and experimentally relevant to uh, make the cells addicted to a thousand kinase receptors. So uh, we selected the, 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 the different models and uh, we uh, performed this preclinical trial. So we implanted the the, um, the tumors, we allowed them to grow, and then we started treatment. So the point is that we didn't know what to use to treat because of, uh, we didn't know if uh, um, monoclonal antibody versus uh, um, thyrosine kinase inhibitor could be more efficient. So we decided to try to test all the possibility. So we used the monoclonal antibodies such as cetaxima, borpanitulumbab, or thyrosine kinase inhibitor such as erlotinib and lapatinib alone or in combination. This is a representative uh, uh, trial, but uh, I mean, uh, the great majority of the samples behave in this way. So uh, the uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor were all usually non not effective, while the uh, monoclonal antibody, either cetaxima or panitumumab, were. However, the uh, combination between the cetaximab and the thousand kinase inhibitor, either of the two, was much more effective and resulted in a complete response. Not only in a complete response, but also in a long-lasting one. And in fact, as you can see, we always 
observed a relapse when we uh, are treated with the, only the monoclonal antibody, but we never observe a relapse when we uh, did the co-treatment, even uh, not uh, after the uh, treatment withdrawal. So uh, this uh, um, suggests that, that uh, uh, the um, combo therapy can be more effective. So we wanted to understand why. And as you can see, uh, while the uh, single therapies were able to decrease the intensity of the signal, such as phosphomarkinase activation of phosphorus 6, only the, the combo was able to uh, abrogate the signal. And this probably is due to the fact that the signal driven by the amplified receptor is so strong that uh, only one way of inhibition, either the TKI or the cetaxima per se, is not sufficient. But in case of uh, uh, amplified humor, this is probably why the combo treatment is more effective. And uh, a few months, uh, few months after we published our work, um, a, a paper came out in uh, JCO in which uh, the author had uh, retrospectively analyzed the uh, gastric cancer patient with EGFR amplification. And uh, uh, they observed that uh, um, in uh, EGFR inhibitors alone or in combination with chemotherapy, uh, led to a higher objective response rate, progression free survival, and overall survival than what is expected with the standard of care, but only in uh, these uh, patients which have been biomarker selected for EGFR amplification. And of course, this uh, uh, is in support of the clinical benefit in uh, patients of targeting EGFR in uh, patients with EGFR amplified tumors. And of course, this uh, let's say, reinforcing the translational value of the studies that we are doing. Uh, while uh, uh, performing this work, we uh, also used uh, a negative control, uh, primary cell lines uh, derived from uh, our tumors, and uh, uh, I mean, expecting not to see any response uh, to uh, EGFR um, targeting. However, life is never as you think it can be. And uh, uh, sorry, among all the cell lines uh, we uh, analyzed, we found that around 10%, more or less, respond very well to um, EGF receptor targeting. Some of them have an intermediate response, and the great majority are not responders. So uh, we also, perf I mean, validated these results in vivo, and this is just, uh, these are just two examples. So when we in vitro found a response, also in vivo, we observed uh, a very strong activity of cetaxima. And as you can see here, uh, the um, combination of cetaxima plus the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, in this case, was not necessary because the uh, antibody alone well, gave more or less the same kind of response. And this is probably due to the fact that in this case, we have less signal, and so the antibody itself is able to completely block it. So, which is, uh, once we know that, uh, let's say, 10% of the tumor can, uh, without EGF amplification, can respond to EGF receptor targeting, the main problem is how can we identify this patient? So can we find the biomarkers to select them? And this is what we did, so we tried to do. And we have uh, now some candidates, for example, this uh, uh, responding, uh, the responding cases, this is just an example, but this is something that we have always found uh, in, reproducibly. Uh, they have a, a higher level of R3 expression and uh, of beam expression. And in this case, uh, we have always seen a difference from between the good responders and the intermediate responder. And the other thing is that we have seen a, a higher level of the phosphatase uh, PTPRJ in the non responder. And again, this is uh, something meaningful because this is a phosphatase able to um, dephosphorylate the EGF receptor. So we have uh, um, another thing is that uh, in most of the cases, uh, of the responding cases, we have found uh, um, an increased expression of two of the EGF receptor ligands, Ereg and Ereg. Uh, and we have also shown that uh, if we um, uh, silence uh, this ligand, 
the viability of the cells is strongly decreased. So in line with the idea that uh, this taximab can compete with the ligand uh, and uh, that the activation of the receptor um, due to the ligands is important. Uh, the, um, so we are now um, obtained all the samples of one of these trials performed in the past, of which, of course, the clinical response is available. We do not have it because everything is in blind, but it's available. And we have uh, generated an algorithm uh, for the analysis of the biomarkers. And uh, uh, this, of course, will tell us if uh, on the basis of the analysis of these biomarkers, we can identify the uh, patients that uh, uh, are um, responsive to EGF receptor target. So in conclusion of this part, we have obtained evidence supporting the rationale to target uh, the EGF receptor pathway in uh, molecularly defined uh, adenocarcinoma, meaning in those with uh, um, EGF amplification. And uh, um, we have uh, uh, shown that in this context, the dual EGF receptor inhibition uh, can be a novel, novel and most effective more effective strategy to target these tumors. And uh, uh, we have recently found also that a small uh, but significant percentage of not amplified uh, tumors respond to EGF receptor inhibition. Of course, in this case, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, to validate uh, the biomarkers to identify these patients. So overall, uh, the, um, this observation has shown the, very, the, the high importance, the great importance of the molecular ultra selection in the definition of patients with gastric cancer who might be candidate to the EGF receptor therapy. So another target we studied is R2. R2 is amplified in around 20% of gastric cancer. And uh, of course, and it is of course usually associated with uh, the chromosomal instability subtype. And uh, uh, differently from breast cancer, only two drug, two or two targeted drugs have been approved in uh, gastric cancer context. It is uh, the uh, antibody trastuzumab and the drug conjugate trastuzumab deroustica. Uh, however, the efficacy of these treatments in uh, gastric tumors is much, much less than in breast cancer. And this uh, has, uh, let's say, raised the question of the real cost effectiveness of this treatment. So we, for this reason, we aim to investigate uh, the therapeutic efficacy of different uh, to targeting strategies. And also in this case, we consider amplify uh, cases having at least a copies. And uh, so to perform our studies, we undertook uh, uh, a prospective evaluation over to targeting using again monoclonal antibodies and uh, thousand kinase inhibitors. So we went back to our platform and identified eight cases with uh, each, uh, with her two amplification ranging from eight to more than 200 copies. But as you can see, even in the presence of this quite huge amplification. Only four cases said uh, response uh, um, evaluated according to the racist criteria. So uh, when we uh, analyze these cases, uh, we mm, found, as I mean, in the same way I described before, we found that indeed uh, they were uh, responsive to Tastuzumab, but the response was not uh, striking. I think that these cases have 200 copies, this has 150 copies. So one would expect uh, a much stronger response. Um, but while uh, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors were not active as well, and uh, not even the Pertuzumab, Pertuzumab is a monoclonal antibody, R2. Uh, directly in the antibody, but uh, differently from Trastuzumab, Trastuzumab targets mainly HER2 heterodimers, while Trastuzumab targets HER2 homodimers. So they act in a different way, even if they target the very same target. So as you can see also in this case, the combo was much more effective than the, the single drug. And uh, also in this case, we found that, that the, um, let's say, the response was really long lasting and we never observed any um, relapse. 
So um, while uh, um, also here we perform the biochemical analysis and we got uh, the same kind of results I've shown you before for the EGF receptor, meaning that again, probably in the excess of signal, we need more than one way to uh, target the, um, the cells. Uh, uh, I've shown you uh, four cases responsive, but we also uh, found non-responsive cases like these ones. And uh, uh, I mean, we also we found that these cases were uh, all with uh, low copy numbers, so less uh, less than ten, and they uh, never responded. In our opinion, this means that these cells are not really addicted to R2. In, uh, in clinical practice, R2 is not given alone, but it's always given uh, in uh, together with chemotherapy. But in our studies, we don't we didn't want to add chemotherapy because we want we were interested in studying the pure effect of uh, signaling. <laughs> so probably this in this case, this, uh, uh, these uh, tumors are not. Uh, uh, dependent uh, on, uh, are not addicted to R2. And uh, we uh, also performed studies in cell lines, so uh, analyzing cell lines with uh, amplifi R2 amplification, but with uh, low copy number. So when you have a high copy number, you have a, a response, but if, with low copy number, you don't have. So probably, by, for sure, a larger part of cases are needed. But uh, we believe that uh, um, the level of amplification where two is really important in, the, in identifying those cases uh, that are addicted and so that uh, uh, can be uh, killed by the uh, abrogation of the R2 dependent signal. Uh, we then wanted also to have some proof that what we are uh, seeing in mice uh, can recapitulate what is uh, found in humans. And uh, so uh, among the patients uh, with R2 amplification, only two have been treated with trastuzumab because uh, trastuzumab is um, approved for metastatic tumors. And usually tumors that undergo surgery are not metastatic. So once the tumor is removed, there's no need to treat this patient with trastuzumab. But this happened in two of the cases we studied. And so we went to look, this is the first patient we generated here the um, um, uh, the DPDX, and the patient uh, did not respond to trastuzumab, but he underwent uh, uh, disease progression. And uh, as you can see, also in uh, the PDX, uh, we did not have any response to trastuzumab. However, when we analyze the genotype of these patients, we found this is uh, 80 copies over two. We found that uh, the totality of these copies with an allelic frequency of almost 100% um, uh, be, uh, pre um, uh, presented a mutation, an activated mutation of uh, uh, HER2. And uh, in, um, as you can see, while lapatinib was not effective alone, uh, when uh, it was associated to trastuzumab, it was uh, very, very effective. Unfortunately, we <coughs> found this only one after the patient, uh, the patient uh, um, died, but uh, otherwise we would have uh, um, had the possibility to uh, suggest it to the, to the uh, physicians. Another case, uh, in this case, uh, we obtained uh, the PDX from uh, at surgery. Then uh, the patients responded to trastuzumab. Uh, he had a pa uh, partial response. And as you see also in our hands, uh, the uh, tumor was responsive uh, to, um, <coughs> to trastuzumab. Then uh, he uh, underwent uh, disease stabilization, but at a certain point he progressed and de developed lung metastasis. This metastasis was resected and we got the PDX from it. And as you can see, also in this case, there was no response to trastuzumab exactly as in the patients. But uh, in uh, both cases, I want to show you that I want you to, to, to appreciate that uh, the response we observed uh, with the combo was uh, um, increased. Unfortunately, the, we are, well, we are trying to set up a trial with uh, these uh, selected patients to see the efficacy of uh, uh, the combination of therapies. Another case uh, in which uh, we did not observe any response, as you see, 
is this one. Uh, and when we analyzed the, the genome, we found amplification of KRAS. And so we uh, wanted to see if we could overcome the resistance due to the KRAS to the use of uh, the um, antibody conjugates, and in particular, OptiDX. This is uh, uh, trastuzumab conjugated with uh, the, the Ruxtecan, the topper on his own race inhibitor, uh, to a cleavable linker. So uh, this uh, antibody acts because it is uh, internalized, and uh, then the linker is cleaved, the, um, the, the Ruxtecan is made free, and it is uh, a membrane permeable, so it can exit from the cells and enter in the neighboring cells, even if they do not have, if, if they do not express a two. And this is very important in gastric cancer, where there is a very huge heterogeneity. So only percentage of cells express, uh, um, let's say, a high percentage uh, of an high amount of uh, um, R two. And uh, as you can see, indeed. Uh, with the use of uh, the, uh, the Ruxtecan, we uh, obtain a response, and so we could overcome the resistance due to KRAS amplification. So, uh, in conclusion of this part, this uh, trial indicate that, that in R2-driven gastric tumors, a boosted uh, R2 uh, targeting uh, is required for optimal efficiency, and this can lead to complete and durable response. And uh, uh, they also suggest that the selective subpopulation of uh, um, hyperamplified R2 uh, patients could benefit from this strategy. And uh, there has been a trial, a uh, Jacob trial, uh, using uh, Trastuzumab and Trastuzumab, which was negative. But uh, uh, also in this case, uh, uh, the analysis of the uh, patients with uh, R2 amplification has not been done. Uh, R2 amplification, R2 hyper amplification. They were all, of course, selected, but uh, the high level of amplification has not been uh, done. And we requested uh, the um, samples uh, to brush, uh, but uh, the, the, the quality of the DNA we received did not allow us to perform uh, this analysis. So we would like to. Um, to test it in a trial. Uh, okay, the last uh, um, subject I want to touch in uh, this field is that uh, another question we asked was if there is any genetic dependency guiding a response to part one inhibitors in uh, gastric tumor. So why this came uh, to our mind? So why did we ask uh, if a PARP inhibitor would regimen which has been already approved in other tumor types can have, can be efficient uh, can be can have efficacy in a subgroup of gastric cancer patients well uh, around 12 percent of uh, gastric cancer patients via alteration in genes involved in the DNA damage parents so theoretically speaking they could benefit from a part inhibition. And, uh, however, also in this case, uh, clinical trial conducted in non-molecular selected population of uh, patients uh, were negative. And uh, so, in our opinion, uh, this means that uh, an a priori selection of patients is necessary to identify, if any, the population that could benefit from this strategy. So, uh, again, if we went back uh, to our platform and looked for uh, cases uh, bearing alteration in the, gen in the genes of the homologous combination. And uh, as you can see, the uh, most widely altered gene is BRCA2. We never found uh, any alteration of BRCA1. And uh, uh, all these patients, uh, all these mutations were germline mutations. And uh, uh, I want you to notice, because it will become interesting later, that all these tumors were of the intestinal surprise. So uh, from a preliminary uh, in vitro experiment we had, we decided to focus on um, loss of function, germinal, or in cases uh, displaying germinal loss of function of paracatu. And uh, we went to uh, our mice to perform the preclinical trial. 
Well, as you can see, uh, in uh, five uh, uh, cases where we had uh, the germline mutation plus the loss of the second allele, we have three out of five cases responding. This is a stable disease in uh, resistance. And while, of course, as a control, we used uh, um, cases with the germline mutation, but uh, in which the well-type allele was conserved. And of course, as expected, they did not uh, respond uh, to all other. Uh, since it is known uh, that uh, in, in parietal tumors, the response to olaparib is uh, uh, often parallel by the response to platinum-based uh, regimens, we also uh, tested this. And uh, as you can see, uh, the cases responsive to olaparib were, were also responsive to platinum, while the non-responder did, I mean, did not. So at this point, uh, our question was, okay, so we have uh, five cases, uh, they, uh, three of them responding to no, the responding. And if you look, for example, the mutation, I mean, they are really identical in terms of mutation. And, and we went to look at the genome to find the difference, but we couldn't find anything that let's say, uh, sorry. The only difference we found is that, that the three responsive cases were all mi microsatellite stable, while the non-responding one were microsatellite instable. So uh, we, I mean, we didn't believe it too much, but we said, okay, so let's take these cells, MSS responsive, and uh, um, let's remove uh, uh, through uh, CRISPR-Cas9 technology MH1 uh, to render them uh, MMR deficient. And this is what we did. And uh, uh, we got a different clones. And as you see, uh, what we found is that while the parental cells were, as I've shown, responsive to uh, Olaparib, the um, and, um, knocked out uh, MLH1 knockout cells were not. And uh, I want to add that at the time we performed this experiment, uh, these cells were not uh, microsatellite unstable because uh, the, um, let's say, knockout event was too fresh to have allowed the accumulation of mutations. So the, uh, the main difference was the loss of this gene rather than the increased tumor burden or the elongation of the microsatellites. And uh, what to me was even more strange was the fact that uh, we uh, evaluated the uh, proficiency of the homologous uh, recombination system with the RAD51 focus formation assay. So uh, RAD51 is downstream of BRCA2. And uh, uh, once uh, there is the activation of the pathway, um, RAD1 is recruited uh, to BRCA2. And so it, you can see foci of BRCA2. So if you see an higher number of foci, it means that uh, the um, homologous recombination pathway is that, exactly. And uh, as we know, we of course uh, have seen that the wild type was uh, homologous recombination deficient. And in fact, it was responsive uh, to Olaparib uh, according to the synthetic lethality system. Uh, while the, the clones we uh, looked at uh, became eight um, homologous recombination proficient upon uh, MLH1 uh, silencing. So this means we are now trying to understand why this happens. We have a few ideas, and, but uh, not easy to show. But uh, um, the next question we asked was, OK, but is this uh, typical of all the genes of the MMR, or is this restricted to uh, the um, MLH1? <laughs> so we knocked out MSH2 which is the second gene for frequency altered in gastric cancer. But uh, we found something completely different because, as you see, in this case, the uh, MSH2 um, knockout does not alter the response uh, to um, the um, to laparin, meaning that probably what is important uh, is not the the, uh, let's say, the acquisition of further mutation, but rather the, the gene involved. We don't know if the acquisition of mutation, so the progression along the, uh, the, um, the mismatch repair inactivation, so the acquisition of a real MSI status can do something else because of 
these cells have been generated uh, 10 months ago, and they are just starting to be inside. So it takes time for the cells to acquire instability in vitro human cells. Uh, another question we asked was, uh, okay, is this restricted to gastric cancer or is it shared with other tumors? So uh, it's not easy to find uh, an MSS, uh, BRCA2 mutated tumors, uh, sublines, but we uh, found uh, some of them. Uh, this is a, a pancreatic uh, cancer cell line. And as you see, uh, also in this case, when we um, inactivated MH1, we partially answered the Zika response. Uh, we have also tried that uh, because it is uh, in uh, ovarian cell lines and in prostate cell lines because the frequency of BRCA mutation is higher. But uh, in this case, uh, we have not observed this behavior. So we cannot take a conclusion yet because we have not done a sufficient number of cells, so it can be by chance. But for the results that we have now, this behavior has been observed in non-hormone dependent cell lines. Uh, okay, so um, another thing that uh, was uh, strange for us is that uh, five uh, out of the seven germline mutation were, um, uh, let's say, affected the K332-6, which according to the CLINVAR database of uh, breast and ovarian cancer, is non-pathogenic. However, uh, when we looked at the families, I mean, uh, there was a clear uh, suggestion for a, a role of this mutation, because look at this family, uh, the, the frequency of gastric cancer is absolutely high, the same is here. So uh, it's hard to believe that this mutation was not pathogenic. And uh, so we uh, performed uh, some uh, experiments. So, uh, for example, we applied the genomic homologous recombination deficiency signature. And as you can see, we, uh, the, uh, the, the, the cases with the mutation uh, had a uh, signature completely different from those uh, the responsive one. And also, if you look at, I mean, from a biological point of view, the uh, inactivation of the HR system in the presence of the mutation was clear, meaning that, that this can no longer be considered a mutation, uh, a non-pathogenic mutation, at least in non-hormone-dependent tumors. So um, to try to give a translational value to our findings, uh, since uh, Laparib is not used in gastric cancer, we could not uh, uh, Looks, we did not have any patients to study. So we uh, used uh, the treatment with platinum-based uh, chemotherapies as a proxy of the response to Olaparib. And this is a core of patient. And as you can see, nine out of 11 of the patients showing alteration in the homologous recombination system fall in the um, higher, um, in the patients with the higher uh, median progression for survival, meaning that probably the presence of this uh, alteration um, can help uh, the response uh, to, to plan. So um, we, in conclusion of this part, we propose to introduce uh, in gastric cancer patient treatment the definition of the hereditary intestinal gastric cancer, which is uh, characterized by intestinal histology and BRCA2 germline mutation. And uh, this is a different entity with respect to the hereditary diffuse gastric cancer, which is uh, um, associated to a diffuse phenotype and is due to Icadere in germline mutation. Uh, of course, we are continuing our studies uh, because the evidence we have at the moment suggests that the uh, optimal targets are uh, patients bearing uh, BRCA2 germline mutation of the MSS type. Uh, of course, this would, uh, we would, I mean, it would be nice to do a trial, but this is not possible because due to the frequency, the very low frequencies of uh, uh, patients, uh, uh, because the BRCA2 mutation is not usually uh, evaluated and uh, uh, the MSI patients uh, with bracket mutated are really low. So it would be nice, but it's a dream. And uh, finally, we have identified this variant uh, as uh, we believe that uh, it is a new pathogenic variant. 
And with this, I just want to um, thank uh, my group and in particular Simona Kors that together with me did uh, this uh, um, project and uh, many collaborators, uh, the Italiano Ricerca su Calcino Magastico and in particular Filippo Pietrantonio at the Link in Milan, but uh, many others. And uh, of course, uh, uh, I for funding our work and uh, uh, the patients and the family that allowed us to collect the samples and perform the studies. And you for your attention.